Welcome to episode 189 of Mighty Life Radio. I am Matt Blackburn, your host, and today is a solo q and I've been wanting to do more of these because people seem to really enjoy it, and a lot of questions come from what I share on social media, and people want details and my nuanced thoughts on different things. So I had the listeners send in a bunch of questions, and I probably have about 100 here that I'll try to rapid fire. I tend to be long-winded because a lot of these answers are not just a simple one-sentence blurb. There's actually some context around it and some pre-understandings that have to occur to understand the main point. But I'll do my best to make the answers as concise as possible. So let's jump right in. Could it be sustainable and healthy to consume plant-based whole foods, excluding meat, dairy, and eggs, take all the MitoLife supplements, and Rosita cod liver oil. So this is a very individual question. I think genetics play a huge role, and that's something that my friend Tyler Pansner got me really interested in with our last interview. And I've been delving into it, and ever since I've been in natural health, over a decade, I've seen really the epigenetics drum being beat over and over again, that epigenetics is the most important thing and it trumps genetics. And I definitely disagree. I think genetics are our blueprint and it's really good to understand them. And over the last two or three years, I've heard people say they have MTHFR. That's a common mutation, but I had never heard of COMT mutation. I never heard of VDR mutations. I've never heard of DHCR7 mutation, which is what I have and what prevents or lowers your ability to generate vitamin D from ultraviolet light. That's a pretty big deal if you don't know that you have that. So I think having kind of a basic understanding of some of those things about your body. But I've met really smart vegans that seem to have a very well functioning brain and a good memory. And it really just comes down to how good you feel. And if your mood's good, your energy's good, your sleep's good, you're able to learn things and recall them fairly easily. I think keep going with it. But from my experience, I tried to make veganism and vegetarian work multiple times, probably five, six times with different combination of supplements, and I just couldn't make it work. So if it's an ethical thing to get over, that's more of a spiritual thing. That's what it was for me. Um, And in the end, Dr. Cass Ingram was the final straw to change my mind and permanently move me out of the plant-based Lifestyle. Highly recommend going back and listening to that show because right after that show, I bought ground beef and never looked back. Just the way that he explained it was uh, really useful from a, a spiritual level and also a physiology level. Your experience and experiment with the bean protocol. Yeah, so I recently introduced or reintroduced beans into my diet. And I tend to have a whole can after I come in from milking my goat. So I wake up, I have my breakfast, I go on a short walk, I come back, I make my espresso shots, I drink those, I go out and milk my goat, and then I come back in and make some beans and just eat them by themselves with salt. And this is based on the work of Karen Hurd. She created the bean protocol and just been experimenting with it. And there's different ways to use it. So if you eat the beans with fat, that's for a certain condition. And if you eat them without any fat, that is the strongest effect to lower excess adrenaline. So the whole idea is that 90 to 95% of toxins and hormones that your body is trying to get rid of will just recirculate. 
if you don't have enough fiber, especially soluble fiber. This is kind of the brains behind the bean protocol. And so when you eat beans, which are an excellent source of soluble fiber, they will bind to excess adrenaline and all of the stuff that's in our bile, and you will pass that into the toilet. And very simple, and it makes sense. When I was doing really extreme <laughs> one-hour eating window intermittent fasting, for six months straight, I really wrecked my body. I looked incredible. I got shredded. I really went down in body fat percentage, but I was pretty much living on beans and soy. It was a really interesting diet and, and protein powders. And it, it kind of worked, but I still felt stressed. And I think that's because I was fasting for 23 hours. So now that I'm eating usually three meals a day, I find it really useful in between meals to have a bowl of beans and salt. And I'm not recommending that everybody do this. This is just something that makes me feel good at this moment. Maybe it won't work for me in the future, but for now, I enjoy it. And I do seem to feel that reduction in stress. I don't know if it's placebo, but it does make sense that we need fiber and I tried fiber free multiple times and felt really bad. So I feel best when I have fiber constantly going through my system personally. All right, I'm already getting <laughs> long winded. So answer a little quicker at these next ones. Five milligrams of zinc for eight milligrams of copper. Is that good? So I've been supplementing with 50 milligrams of zinc bisglycinate, usually once a day, sometimes twice a day but usually right before bed. And I track my sleep with the old Aura Ring. And I find that it helps improve my sleep. And remember, we don't absorb all of that 50 milligrams. So even though the pill says, or the bottle says 50 milligrams per serving, realistically, I'm probably getting 20, 25 milligrams out of that, something around there. And the ratio of zinc to copper varies. I've seen all sorts of different ratios and Jason Hommel, the creator of that copper, the high dose copper protocol. Um, he has his own ideas of the, the zinc to copper ratio. And I think it's a lot of experimentation. I wasn't taking any zinc when I was high dose and copper on that protocol. And I definitely developed low zinc symptoms. And so I think 50 milligrams of zinc, especially if you've been vegetarian or vegan in the past, like me, I was plant-based for pretty much a decade. And so I created a pretty severe zinc deficiency and you could absolutely be more deficient in zinc than copper, or you could be deficient in both. So it's all about nuance and bio-individuality. That's what I've been Going back to this last week and just realizing there's a lot of extremism in the natural health world where it's never take zinc, never take ascorbic acid, never take vitamin D, never take, never take X, Y, Z. And I think it's another restrictive thing, kind of like restrictive dieting. It just reduces the options that someone has. Don't take 5-HTP because it's going to raise your serotonin and serotonin's bad. It's a stress hormone. Therefore, 5-HTP is bad. And it's not that simple. If you go to self-decode and you put in your genome text file from 23andMe or whatever, or your DNA through self-decode, you do through them, you can see if 5-HTP is a good supplement for you. And some people do genuinely need it. So I wouldn't be afraid of zinc just because you know, the dogma is that it will obliterate copper. If you're zinc deficient, then you can't have retinal binding protein and you'll have retinol issues. So zinc is required for proper use of vitamin A from the liver to transport it around. And really every supplement has a use in context and something that works for you now might not work for you in the future. So it's a lot less stressful approach than to look at 
you know, all the supplements as being harmful and bad, and there's only the small handful that are good. Everybody has a different history. Everyone has different genetics, maybe more, most importantly, and that will determine how they're affected by different supplements. Someone asks, if you find and settle with the one GF, would you want and have a baby? Yes, I plan on having a family someday. That's something I learned running a homestead alone by myself is that it's a lot of work and it's definitely not sustainable to be a lone wolf and just one guy keeping multiple different farm animals and gardening and chopping down trees because you'd have to intermittent fast. If I kept this up for years, I would just not have time to eat three meals a day. And there's even times now where I have to reach for my raw goat milk just to get me through or venison jerky or gummies. And all these things are kind of demonized by some in the pro metabolic community because it's not a complete meal, but these things have saved me in the past two winters living here where stuff happens, stuff breaks. You have to be outside. You have to skip a meal you have to have strategies to get you by. And even if you live in the city, stuff could still happen. Someone could get hurt and you need to leave at the drop of a dime or whatever it is. So having snacks, making your own gummies, which are absolutely a game changer, changed my life, homemade gummies, the recipe on my website for that. Really, really important. Okay, here we go. Abigail asks, in-depth discussion of proper Vitamin D levels and why would be appreciated. So my friend, Dr. Tyler Pansner is a huge advocate and fan of vitamin D3, the supplement. And he says that it changed his life because he measured his 25 D levels and they were low in the middle of summer and he had a full tan and he didn't understand why his 25 OHD level was low in the middle of summer. So if you've been following my work for the last couple of years, you've probably seen me talk on this show and social media against supplemental vitamin D. And several years ago, when I was going to the health food store and hanging out with my friend that worked there and walking the supplement aisles and buying tons of different supplements and experimenting with everything. I never really got into vitamin D3. I never took it consistently. I took it here and there, but I just never delved into the research. And then a couple of years ago, uh, through my friend, Justin Stellman of extreme health radio, I found Morley Robbins and his protocol. And he is, very against zinc, ascorbic acid, and vitamin D. That's kind of the hallmark of his whole protocol is you have to cut those out and able to be able to heal. And so I did that for the last two years and it was okay. I felt pretty good, but I definitely had some fatigue going on, definitely had brain fog and just up and down mood and just lower resilience to stress. I was overall functional, but I felt like I wasn't progressing like I should with my health, especially with all the things I was doing. Dynamic neurofeedback, hyperbaric oxygen, sensory deprivation, floating, all of these things didn't seem to be making as much of an impact as they should on my health. And I think it's because I was chronically deficient in ascorbic acid, or you could say ascorbate. I was deficient in zinc and I was deficient in vitamin D. And, and I'm basing what I'm saying mostly off of blood tests, except for vitamin C. I wasn't able to get that the other day because I had a bad lab tech that was in a bad mood and he didn't want to pull up the test. It was really weird. But with the zinc and the vitamin D, those are definitely below optimal 
on my previous tests. And my last vitamin D test was about five years ago, and it was around 23 nanograms per milliliter, which is really low by a lot of people's standards. It's just a small handful of people where that is not low, but I have not been able to find a counter argument to the parathyroid hormone argument that there is a inverse relationship with vitamin D3 as the 25 OHD form, otherwise called the storage form. So there's a relationship between calcium, parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D. And I've read studies where it says the 25D has to be at least 50 to lower parathyroid hormone. And I've read studies where it has to be at least 40 or above to keep parathyroid hormone levels in check. And why do we want to keep PTH low? Because it inhibits mitochondrial respiration, causes inflammation, and largely contributes to soft tissue calcification. And the arguments put forth by Trevor Marshall, Jim Stevenson Jr., Morley Robbins, they're very convincing. And it convinced me to question the Vitamin D Council and question Michael Hollick and question Mercola and a lot of these people in the limelight that have been talking about vitamin D for decades. And say, hey, maybe the other forms of vitamin D matter. What about D4? What about D5? That's what Adam Bergstrom often talks about. But that makes me think about vitamin E. And some people say you must get the mixed tocopherol version or else it's toxic, or you must get all tocopherols with all tocotrienols to get all eight isomers. Otherwise, you're taking fractionated vitamin E and that's harmful to your health or whatever, which is just not true. The hepatic alpha tocopherol transfer protein called TTP has the strongest affinity for the alpha tocopherol isomer of vitamin E. So that one is the most important, hands down. It's not the tocotrienols, it's not gamma tocopherol, You don't necessarily need a mix to make it not harmful. And the same thing with vitamin D. The 25 OHD is really important. And there's a reason why there's this much research about it. It's not all conspiring against us to harm us. I think a lot of the harm with supplements, like let's say someone buys their supplements at Costco I think it's the titanium dioxide in there. Maybe they're taking their supplements with their tap water or their Brita water and they're bathing in unfiltered water and they're sleeping in multiple Wi-Fi signals and they're not taking the supplements to balance it out. So this is what I appreciate about my friend Tyler Pansner is he's not saying that vitamin D3 is always safe to supplement. I think that's really dangerous advice for someone with an audience to say that something's always safe or always dangerous. I'm really moving away from that mentality because I think it's a very extreme perspective and it doesn't take into account genetics and context in the individual. It's just blanket statement saying something's always safe or always harmful. I think some supplements are useless for the most part, like liposomal supplements, I still think that those are a waste of money and overpriced and encapsulated vitamins and minerals and enzymes work. They're time tested and proven. And I think it's even safer to get it that way instead of forcing it in with a micelle or liposomal uh, formulation. But getting back to what I was saying, you know, the Costco consumer getting their supplements there or from GNC or whatever, Walmart, they're not balancing those supplements with the counterparts. So, for example, let's say the last couple of years with COVID, right? We heard about the COVID cocktail. I think I've talked about it. Zinc, ascorbic acid, and vitamin D. 
Well, are those three inherently harmful? No, obviously they're nutrients with tons of research behind them. Look up Carl Pfeiffer and his books about zinc. Really important mineral, really important to make the diamine oxidase enzyme. It's not all copper. It's not all ceruloplasmin. It's always a symphony and a dance with all of the vitamins and minerals and copper is not better than zinc and retinol is not better than vitamin D and magnesium is not better than calcium. They're all equally important because if you're missing the counterpart, then nothing's going to work. So when it comes to vitamin D, there's vitamin K2, there's magnesium, you could say boron, which is involved with calcium and magnesium and vitamin D. Some people even say zinc, but I just kind of go boron, K2, magnesium. Someone needs to be taking all of those if they're taking vitamin D3. And if someone's taking zinc, especially high dose zinc, let's say hundreds of milligrams, then they want to be taking copper. And that could be Jason Hommel's homemade copper sulfate, or that could be the copper bisglycinate in my beef liver supplement that I just released. And with ascorbic acid, the counterpart to that is copper. So the counterpart to both zinc and ascorbic acid is copper. And I'm sure there's more that I'm not remembering right now, but copper is the main one that's on a seesaw with those two nutrients. And I was thinking about it earlier. I really appreciate what Jason Hommel's doing with the copper revolution and his high dose copper. Really controversial. People think it's overkill and extreme and harmful. And he gets a lot of flack. But I think what it taught me was the relationships between nutrients. You know, I've told that story before when I was getting up to 100 milligrams a day of copper with this protocol, my hand started to turn color and my mom was freaking out. I was in California visiting them at the time and she said, what's with your hands? They're, they're red. And Jason told me to supplement zinc and take ascorbic acid and they changed colors a few times and then they came back. And the reason for that is because ascorbic acid actually changes copper from a uh, plus two valent state to a plus one. And it's my understanding that ascorbic acid or ascorbate is the final handoff from ceruloplasmin to get copper into the cells. So... It's not about demonizing ascorbic acid because it touches copper. It's realizing what it does with copper, and it's a good relationship. It actually manages the redox states of iron and copper in a good way. And ascorbic acid has been something that's been incredible for me to stabilize my energy levels and my mood. I just really feel a stress resilience like I've never had before supplementing ascorbic acid. And it's not about high dosing multiple grams all at once. It's about consistency. So I know this is a super long response to that vitamin D question, but it's a big deal. I'll have to have a whole show on that here in the next month or so of why I changed my mind. But I basically told you it's because I have that mutation called DHCR7 gene mutation, and that's an enzyme called 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase. So that gene makes that enzyme. And one of the roles of that enzyme, besides working with cholesterol, is actually the synthesis of vitamin D. And if that gene is mutated, either heterozygous or homozygous mutation, then you will have a reduced ability to make vitamin D from the sun. And no one ever thinks about that, right? They say just you never have to supplement because you can get it from light and food. And that was my mentality for the last two years or so. But I did not know this gene existed. 
before Tyler was on my show. So that's a huge game changer. And through self decode, that's going to be next week's show. I'll put the link below. If you want to check that out, it's like 400 bucks, I think for lifetime and it analyzes over 83 million SNPs called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So you could look up genes, health conditions, and it really breaks down what you're more susceptible to. You know, for example, I'm more susceptible to increased cadmium and my vitamin A requirements are higher. In the context of this vitamin D discussion, according to my genetics, I am more prone to having higher calcium levels, which I think is a benefit. And I think is one more reason to keep my vitamin D at a higher level because that is what partly manages calcium. So getting back to the PTH thing, I know we kind of went on a little tangent there, but basically if you have low parathyroid hormone levels, then you are less susceptible to soft tissue calcification. And you also have systemic improved energy production the mitochondria are going to work better with lower parathyroid hormone. And I have not been able to find an argument refuting this by the anti-D crowd. And I was in it. And I debated them and I've been going back and forth with them for the last couple of years. And I have not heard a coherent anti-argument to the increased parathyroid hormone if they say that 25D doesn't matter and there's all these different forms, then why is there a definitive relationship between PTH and 25-hydroxy vitamin D? It's just a fact. Every study, when you search 25-hydroxy vitamin D and parathyroid hormone, you'll see study after study after study after study showing that relationship and PTH is the main controller of soft tissue calcification. So as the creator of the CLF protocol, with the first letter being C, I would be a hypocrite if I was not trying to sincerely find the truth about calcification. And I could just say for years that, oh, just eating calcium or getting too much calcium will cause calcification by creating a magnesium and K2 deficiency. But that's only part of the story. And it takes a while. If someone's slamming Perrier and Gerald Steiner and all of these hard mineral waters, over time, if they're not supplementing K2, if they're not supplementing magnesium, and especially in the right doses to balance out the calcium, depending on if that's their primary water that they're drinking, then yes, they will get calcium dysregulation over time and soft tissue calcification, but it takes a while. And there's a lot of moving parts. I think back to when I was vegan and getting pretty much no calcium for a good three years, that would have strongly affected, and I'm sure it did, my parathyroid hormone. Because when there's low levels of calcium in the blood, that stimulates parathyroid hormone secretion, which can lead to a condition called hyperparathyroidism and hypercalcemia. So the body will actually use PTH to stimulate the release of calcium from the bones, whereas 98% of the calcium is, 2% is in circulation, but it will take calcium the PTH will tell your body to take calcium from your bones and put it into the bloodstream, which destroys the bones and decreases the formation of new bones. And if you combine this with vitamin D deficiency, PTH is not kept in check. And I remember sunbathing when I was vegan as much as I possibly could. And after all that time getting my D levels checked, I was still low in 25D, which tells me that this D 
DHCR7 mutation was accurate for me because I sunbathed a lot during that time and I did not raise my vitamin D level. And that's a good segue to a few books that I ordered recently. Well, I have three books here on vitamin D just because I'm fascinated with it now. One's by Judson Somerville, MD. It's called The Optimum Dose. Optimal Dose. I haven't started reading that one yet. But one I've been really enjoying is called How Not to Die with True High Dose Vitamin D Therapy, Coimba's Protocol, and the Secrets of Safe High Dose Vitamin D3 and Vitamin K2 Supplementation by Tiago Henriquez. And like I said, with Jason Hommel and his copper protocol, I think the interesting thing about these high dose protocols with any nutrient is that it gives us a lot of information about what the connections are and what the limits are. And there's just a lot of great information about this book. And he does mention hormone D at the start. He does talk about calcitriol. 125D, a lot of things I wasn't expecting. He has really studied this topic. So highly recommend that book if you're interested in learning more about vitamin D. My girlfriend actually sent me a clip today of Carolyn Dean, the author of The Magnesium Miracle. And she actually said that she has to take 10,000 international units of vitamin D3 a day to keep her levels in the optimal range, her 25 OHD level between 40 and 60. So I found that fascinating because a lot of the magnesium advocates, they're very anti-vitamin D because it uses up magnesium in its conversion from D3 to 25D, that takes magnesium. And then from 25D to 125D, that takes magnesium. But it doesn't mean that vitamin D is bad because it uses up magnesium. And I forgot to mention earlier that parathyroid hormone is actually in control of the 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme that converts 25D to 125D. And parathyroid hormone is what activates that when it's too high. So if you keep PTH in check with keeping 25D at an optimal level, then you can actually lower your 125D, which is a main driver of calcification and hypercalcemia. All right, next question. Have you ever been in front of a biocharger? If so, thoughts? Um, I actually own one and I'm looking to sell it. I never felt anything profound from it. Um, I think if you own a a clinic or a spa, it's nice to have. But as far as a a home unit, I think there are better options. Although it's really expensive, I do really like the Therify, and I feel that so much more than I've ever felt the the biocharger. Uh, Can dissolve it all help with spider veins and varicose veins? Uh, I've heard that testimony from customers, so I think it's definitely worth a try. Um, If on a tight budget, which supplements would you prioritize? With the MitoLife supplements, I would definitely focus on Shilajit, magnesium, vitamin E, it's called Pufa Protect, and K2, called Purely K. Definitely those four, and if you could only do two, it would be the Shilajit and the magnesium. But again, going back to genetics and context and bioindividuality, you definitely have to experiment with different stacks and combinations and find one that makes you feel really good and that helps to bring you into balance. Someone asked, are night terrors caused by mineral imbalance? So this is a really interesting question. I've been experimenting with 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP, and this... It's been a really popular supplement. Jim Carrey's talked about it and said it cured his depression. And a lot of people in the, quote, pro-metabolic community are very against uh, tryptophan or 5-HTP because it is the precursor to serotonin. 
but you can convert your serotonin into melatonin if you block blue light at night. I changed out all the lights in my home for red and orange bulbs, and I fall asleep really quickly and I get tired well before midnight where I'm ready for bed. So I found an interesting study, uh, 5-hydroxytryptophan treatment of sleep terrors in children. It's a 2004 study. And what was fascinating is after one month of supplementing 5-HTP, which was two milligrams per kilogram per day, after one month, 93% of the patients showed a positive response. And after six months, 84% of the children treated with 5-HTP were sleep terror free. So that's pretty incredible. I think 5-HTP and zinc and even vitamin B6, that helps with dream recall and with a lot of other things. And I think a lot of the hate that vitamin B6 gets for contributing to neuropathy you really have to get into the thousands of milligrams. And a lot of the supplements that I've seen and taken have about five milligrams of vitamin B6 in it, maybe 25 max. And I've supplemented 100 to 200 milligrams of vitamin B6 before bed and didn't feel any negative effects. I didn't develop a neuropathy. Someone asks, can I just take cod liver oil without E? And K. I think it depends how much cod liver oil you're taking. If you were megadosing it like me earlier this year, then you definitely want to be taking vitamin E and K2 with it, just so you're not getting a ton of retinol, some vitamin D, and not the other fat soluble vitamins. If you're just taking a moderate amount, then potentially you don't have to supplement E and K2. But I think even over time, you will cause an imbalance in those two fat soluble vitamins. They'll get low. Someone asks, best way to lower high blood pressure, in your opinion? I would look at the three nutrients, magnesium, vitamin E, and vitamin K2. All of those are very important in regulating uh, normal blood pressure. Someone asks, how do you feel from taking BPC-157? So I've been experimenting with a few different uh, oral tincture forms of the peptide uh, BPC-157. And I swish it around in my mouth. I'm just very hyper aware of dental stuff because I think a lot of people in the health community have dental issues, especially if they're uh, anti-vitamin D and maybe even anti-supplementing vitamin K2 and just like a really extreme approach, even fruitarians I've seen, anyone that has a really extreme approach uh, tends to have really inflamed gums and really poor uh, dental health. So I'd like to avoid that. And BPC-157 has become like a staple of my protocol. You know, I use a water pick. I personally don't floss. I only use the water pick. I brush with a Dr. Tongue's ionic toothbrush and I swish with this BPC stuff. And if you search BPC 157 periodontitis, um, you'll see a lot of studies on how it's anti-inflammatory and even improves uh, bone resorption. So in the context of this whole vitamin D discussion. I think it's a great uh, compliment. Someone asked how to handle unavoidable stress, what to focus on to support mental and emotional health. I think social media breaks are the number one thing, at least for me, um, when there's just drama and people losing it and the internet gets crazy and there's a whole lot of uh, jealousy because of the lifestyle that I've created here in Idaho. Um, I just get off the phone and get off of social media and just do a, a week or a week and a half, just reset. And I find that really helps my mental and emotional state. 
And if your business doesn't revolve around social media and your phone, then it's still important to take breaks. Because I think a lot of people get stressed just from the information overload that comes on social media where people are saying opposite things and then people get paralyzed and don't know what to do or do nothing. And I always just encourage everyone to keep an open mind and experiment. And if your personal experience counters what someone like me on a podcast is saying or someone on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube is saying, then just take it with a grain of salt and you know, listen to their other stuff and discount things that counter your personal experience. And always tune in to see if your body's asking for less of a supplement or a food or if it's asking for a break from it. Like for example, the Rosita cod liver oil, I was heavily mega dosing it for several months earlier this year. And then one day my body said, okay, you can take a little less now. And now I take breaks from it. I sometimes take whole days off where I don't take any at all. And that's just where I'm at. So there's really something to that intuitive uh, supplementation where you're really tuning into your body. This is a really good question. Uh, Dean asks, in your experience, how does elk velvet antler differ from pine pollen in its effects? Um, I notice they're both like yang strengthening substances. And I notice more of that yang effect from elk velvet antler than I do from pine pollen. In other words, if I could only take one, it would definitely be elk velvet antler from my experience. So in the middle of winter, when it's super cold and I need to go out and clear the driveway and milk my goat and keep the land managed and handled, taking elk velvet antler with every meal has been really helpful for me to keep my metabolism up, to keep my furnace cooking, my body temperature warm, especially in the winter. I've noticed that effect much more from elk velvet than pine pollen. Someone asks, curious to know more about fat soluble vitamins. So this, this needs to be a whole show, but my short answer is that they are hormones for the most part. Uh, retinol, vitamin A, uh, hormone D, vitamin D, both hormones. I still haven't been able to find whether E and K2 are hormones as well, or their active forms are. I would not be surprised. Vitamin E was originally the fertility vitamin, and that has to do with hormones because it blocks the harmful effects of excess estrogen. I think experimenting with upping your fat soluble vitamin intake we're talking about a d e and k2 is not a bad experience experiment to do for most people you know people will go to coq10 or pqq or all of these more exotic supplements before taking care of the foundational stuff even going to herbs first like fat soluble vitamins are definitely way more foundational than say reishi mushroom or tonkat ali or some herb that you can supplement. These vitamins control gene transcription and the expression of your genes. And we know vitamin D is heavily involved with that, but vitamin A is as well. They work together and they balance each other from toxicity. So that book I mentioned earlier on high-dose vitamin D therapy from Tiago Henriquez, he talks a little bit about K2 in there and the difference between MK4 and MK7. And he thinks that calcium supplementation is ineffective or harmful because people aren't supplementing K2. So it doesn't only balance vitamin D, but it balances calcium. So learning a little bit about these interrelationships, polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs, increase your vitamin E requirements by six times. 
And if you're going to high dose one, let's say you're going to, like I've done, take 20 capsules a day of vitamin K2 of my supplement from MitoLife, you can balance it by taking the others. They prevent toxicity from high dosing if you take the other ones. And there's context there, like high dosing D3, like some people have done over 100,000 IU a day. That should be definitely well thought out and in the context of calcium intake and so many other factors. I think once you get into those really, really, really high doses, then you have to be really smart. But if you're just kind of high dosing something, let's say you know 10,000 IU, 15,000, 20,000, those are the doses of vitamin D that you would get at the equator just sunbathing for half an hour. So it's not uncommon for someone sunbathing to get 10, 15, 20,000 international units of vitamin D. This is a good question. Grounding mats indoors, even with dirty electricity. So they're basically asking, is it safe to use grounding technology indoors? I'm assuming plugging into the third prong in the outlet. So when I've done this in the past, I just made sure to have stetsorizer filters with me. And I plugged in those dirty electricity filters all around. And I felt the difference. I don't know if it was placebo, but I definitely felt better grounding it. Let's say a Hilton or some hotel with all of those filters. And I would usually plug in 10, maybe that's overkill, but it depends <laughs> how you know crowded your hotel is. If it's a huge multi-story, you know, 30 story hotel, then you probably are going to need more filters, but that's my thoughts on it. You know, invest, it's like 125 bucks usually for that dirty electricity meter and get a reading and just a baseline of where you're at. And if it's relatively low, like under 100, ideally you want to get it, I think under 80, even under 50 is even better. The real risk like I remember when I first started measuring, I was at my friend's house, David and Wills, and they live really cr- close to a, like a radio station. And it was off the charts. And I always slept very poorly when I slept at their house. And the reason is their reading was over 2000. And so just plugging in like 10 filters in their house was enough to bring that down around 100. And that makes a huge difference in blood glucose levels and mood and energy and and so much. So ideally, you would ground directly out the window to the earth. But I would say it's another experimentation thing. If you can measure dirty electricity and if you can have some filters and plug the grounding mat in around that, that would be uh, the ideal scenario. This is a common question I get. Advice for those wanting to help others and gain knowledge and credentials. So if I had to simplify my answer here, I would say find something, a subject that you're really passionate about. If this is in the context of natural health and there's so many little niches to fill and find something that maybe you dealt with it was a condition that you dealt with or someone in your family or loved one close to you dealt with and either healed from or degenerated from and learn everything you can about it. Learn every enzyme, every vitamin, every mineral that goes into healing that condition and then talk about it. Talk about it on YouTube write blogs, have a website, have social media accounts, and don't just copy and paste, but put your personal touch onto it and your own spin on it and connect dots in a way that nobody ever has. And I think that's how we really advance this system and help each other is by doing that. It's not going to be by just copying and pasting and robotically following someone's diet or protocol or lifestyle. There's no one diet, one protocol, 
or one lifestyle, even bioenergetic that fits everybody. It's all individual. And people really don't like to hear that because they want to be told what to do. Just tell me what to take. Just tell me what to do. And that can work for a little while until it doesn't because life is about adaptation. We're not static beings where we stay the same for our entire lifetime. Just like the environment goes through changes of seasons, so too does our body and our mind, our emotions. Our entire being goes through seasons of change. And to think that you're always going to eat the same way, research the same way, do the same supplements, do the same protocols, exactly how you are now, that would mean that you're a robot and you're not a human being that is ever changing. So I hope that helps. Maybe one more tip on that question is read a lot of different books, buy books that you're interested in, go to used bookstores and pick out health books that fascinate you. And if you don't know which direction to go, find that out first. And you do that by heavy exploration. That's exactly what I did in Southern California for several years before I made my first YouTube video. And back then I barely knew what I was talking about, but you know what? I talked about what I knew and I did help some people. And the more I know, the more people I help. And that's all I care about. It's not about being right. It's not about never changing. It's not about being consistent for me in my beliefs. It's about helping people. And I will do whatever it takes, whatever changes to help more people. I was thinking about it the other day that any guest I interview on this podcast, we are not going to agree on everything. One educator might be very pro ascorbic acid and very anti supplemental D3. And another person might be anti both ascorbic acid and vitamin D3. And other people might be pro vitamin D3 and anti ascorbic acid. And so there's every flavor of health educator out there and listen to everyone take what makes sense but don't let their knowledge trample on your experience and the smartest of us get caught in it so don't be embarrassed because it happens to everyone but just snap out of the spell and realize that your experience trumps some study or something that a health influencer says all right someone asks way to heal past trauma without talk therapy. So two things come to mind, uh, dynamic uh, neurofeedback. Uh, some people call it brain training. Uh, Neurooptimal is one that I own and I really enjoy. It's kind of a hassle to put the sensors on the head. It takes time, you know, putting them on and taking them off. And there's the sticky uh, putty stuff that keeps it stuck to your scalp. So it's a bit of a production. That's one option. And you could find, uh, quote, trainers to go out and do that. I've seen people uh, cry hooked up on that thing. Another one that's free is dreaming. And when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I started lucid dreaming. My brother got me into it. And on my old PC back then, I made a text file and I recorded over 100 dreams probably close to 150 and maybe 10 percent of them or so were lucid dreams and i've had several in my life where they were very profound to where i woke up feeling much lighter like much lighter life was better i felt like i was a better person i was carrying less baggage and I think where a lot of people get hung up with lucid dreaming is they make it kind of an ego trip. 
And it's kind of like bragging rights. Like I've heard guys say, yeah, I lose a dream every night, you know, because they like to be in control and they're control freaks. And that's not the way to go about it. The way to go about it to me, what I did is I realized I was dreaming in the dream and I flew up to a rooftop and I said, higher self, let me meet you. And a huge purple beam of light showed up and I cried in the dream and I woke up emotional and I was never the same since. So using dreams for that purpose is really powerful. And the first step is remembering your dreams called dream recall. And there's various practices. I've tried a lot of them over the years. You can do what are called reality checks throughout the day. And there's apps for this, which I've used, but for free throughout the day, you can just look down at your hand and say, am I dreaming? But instead of your hand looking normal, like it does now in the dream, it will actually look different. Maybe you'll see a swirl, maybe it'll be wavy, maybe you'll be missing fingers, <laughs> maybe you'll have no fingers, all different options there. But in any event, you'll most likely realize that you're dreaming. Another one is the light switch trick. So in a dream, if you're not sure if you're dreaming or not, you just flip a light switch. And if it doesn't work, there is a good chance that you're dreaming. And there's multiple different reality checks. I used to study a lot of different ones. But to start remembering your dreams, dream journaling, reality checks, vitamin B6, these are three options that you can start to increase your dream recall. And that is the first step before lucid dreaming is you have to remember it. And to me, vitamin B6 and even seafood, I find uh, salmon really helps me remember more dreams if I eat uh, salmon before bed or any kind of uh, cold water seafood. So that's my thoughts there. <laughs> uh, neurofeedback or lucid dreaming for trauma. Someone asked, ever heard of vitamin B17 apricot seeds cures cancer? Question mark. Yeah, I have heard of those. Um, there's so many things that someone could use uh, when they get that diagnosis to get better. And systemic enzyme therapy, deuterium depleted water, uh, rife machines, the, the real rife machines, the plasma ones, like I would use the resonant light brand if it were me. That is kind of where I would start. Just depleting deuterium and Drinking the water is the easiest way to do it. Really increases uh, survival rates for um, people with cancer. And none of this is medical advice. It never is, obviously. But that is what I would do if I got that diagnosis. Can we put our magnesium bicarbonate in the adrenal cocktail? Yeah, I think people have done that. And as I always say, make your own magnesium bicarbonate at home. It's so much more cost effective and not a ripoff to buy a pre-made magnesium bicarbonate online. You definitely want to make it yourself and it's super easy, super fast to make. This is a funny one. Do you ever feel like giving up because of all the flack and controversy you get? One of my favorite quotes is, any publicity is good publicity as long as they spell your name right. And my experience with this, because I've had run-ins with uh, very just destructive individuals, that the less I focus on them, the better I get and the more I advance in life. And the more I focus on them and, and hating them, uh, the slower I advance in life. So I think a big reason why I'm so successful is because I ignore all of the gossipers and the people that are saying negative things about me or my work. And whenever you make waves, whenever you're controversial with ideas, um, you're going to get all sorts of uh, characters coming in. And what I find is just siphoning their energy 
um, to advance my success even further really works. And really, it just puts my name out there so much more. So they're really doing you a service if you're someone dealing with that. And that's really powerful to know. I think that's why a lot of uh, politicians and celebrities get super popular just because they're utilizing that energy and harnessing it for their personal benefit. This is a fun one. Have you thought about getting into ammo reloading and 3D printed guns? Um, I heard Biden is about to sign a bill or he did just sign it uh, banning 3D printing of guns. So definitely wouldn't want to uh, commit a felony there. Uh, ammo reloading, as far as I know, is still legal. But yeah, it's getting really uh, scary. I'm a big uh, pro firearms guy and we see what happened up in Canada. They took away their firearms and now it's just complete communist China. But I would say my advice, if you live in the United States and you don't have any firearms, you only have a couple, I would definitely get it while you can now or soon finally go and take that class and get it done and get your firearm because I think that we're going to need it at some point. This is a good question that I didn't really answer in the last vitamin D question. Someone asked, are you pro vitamin D now like ascorbic acid? I would say yes, but in the context of taking magnesium and vitamin K2 at least, and then ideally having retinol and vitamin E and boron coming in and all the stuff I usually talk about, but mainly magnesium and vitamin K2. Those are really important to balance out vitamin D. And a lot of people have been asking me about brands. Uh, Crucial 4 has been selling one for years. They have a D3 K2 combo. So I would recommend that one if you're looking for a good brand. Someone asks, are we just biding time before things change? Do you believe it will be for the better or worse? I've said it before in previous podcasts, but I think uh, food shortages are going to happen at some point, whether it's in three years or five years or 10 years or 20 years. I think at some point it's inevitable because it's happened multiple times before in human history all around the world. And a lot of the time manufactured, unfortunately, where that's a cheaper way to kill off a whole bunch of people is just uh, starve them to death. So really important to have a little community, uh, grow food, have a source of water, whether it's a spring or a well, which you need to grow food and having cows and goats and sheep is a whole nother thing. I mean, chickens, I think I could keep those year round if I couldn't get access to uh, external resources. But with my goats, I mean, I'm really dependent on Timothy grass and alfalfa, and you need a lot of land uh, to make that. So I often think about that with my goats, that that wouldn't be sustainable if, if I couldn't you know, let's say get gasoline or diesel or propane, like say just worst case scenario, there is no more outside resources at all. Um, I don't think I could continue uh, keeping my goats. I mean, especially in the winter, unless I grow food for them indoors in a growing dome or something, but I'm several years away from being able to do that. Uh, why is beef liver in a capsule? beneficial. So they're talking about my freeze dried beef liver product. So it's kind of a multivitamin. You get a lot of nutrients in there. Vitamin K2, vitamin E, retinol. There's some vitamin D in there. You get B complex vitamins, pretty much all the B vitamins. There's selenium and zinc and copper. And I spiked mine with just a little bit more copper. It's a really great recovery supplement for anyone that is vegan or vegetarian or was 
because a lot of those nutrients, they're going to be deficient in. So when I started supplementing uh, encapsulated beef liver, desiccated liver several years ago, my brain lit up. And a lot of people were asking about getting out of fight or flight or how to manage stress. These B vitamins are really critical. Like if you have anxiety, it could just be a, a B2 deficiency. And thiamine B1 is very important. B5, B6, B7, B12, they're all important. But if you can get them all in liver, that's really powerful. So I take six a day of my beef liver supplement from Mitolife just once a day. And I feel really good from it. Uh, if you were traveling out of the country, what ride or die supplements would you take with you? Uh, magnesium, shilajit, vitamin E, digest it all. Those would really be my top. But what I recommend is getting Ziploc bags. So if you're going to travel, I've taken bottles with me multiple times, but it ends up taking up like a quarter of the suitcase. And so if you can just pour them, you know, as much as you think you'll need in the Ziploc bags and just write on it with a Sharpie on them, you could save a lot of room in your luggage. And that way you could bring all of them because if you're short on energy and you feel fatigued during your trip, I would go for the beef liver with the copper to give you a little boost in energy or the NAD power, the niacinamide. Someone asked, do you avoid liver supplements with C? I assume you're talking about ascorbic acid. If you're talking about whole food vitamin C, it doesn't really matter. But if you're talking about ascorbic acid, I think there's this misconception that it increases uh, iron absorption, but they don't specify usually whether it's heme or non-heme. And it's not very well known that meat, red meat, actually contains both. It's not just heme iron. Uh, meat contains both heme and non-heme iron. And so when it comes to the topic of vitamin C and ascorbic acid and iron absorption, ascorbic acid actually enhances non-heme iron absorption. So the he the the type of iron in liver is going to be mostly heme. So I don't think you really have to worry taking them together. Um, but if you have hereditary hemochromatosis, then just to be safe, you might want to take the ascorbic acid uh, away from any iron containing meal. Someone asked what causes PTH to become high. I think I explained that pretty in depth. So quick answer is low 25 OHD. That is the usual marker that they measure for vitamin D. And it is an accurate one, contrary to what I used to believe. What would you do if you have some calcification in the brain? Can it be removed? So I think if you have calcification anywhere, that is a sign of high PTH, parathyroid hormone, low magnesium, low vitamin K2, low boron, or potentially low in one of those, but they're all relatively safe to supplement. But I would get your, uh, it's called intact parathyroid hormone checked and see if you're high in that because that is a major cause of soft tissue calcification. It's a really complex topic and one that I'm going to be talking about a lot more, the whole vitamin D thing, because there are studies showing that vitamin D supplementation does cause hypercalcemia. I've seen a ton of them, but there's a bunch of variables to consider, like the magnesium status of the animals that they were studying, or the K2 status, or the calcium intake, which alters parathyroid hormone. So there's all these different variables. And just to say that D3 supplementation will cause calcification no matter what is discounting all of these other variables like calcium intake which 
does really matter. Low male testosterone levels, what to do to help that the most. I really like Shilajit. That should be in stock again here shortly, or Mitolife Panacea. Probably another week or so, just say early September. Pine Pollen, Elk Velvet Antler, Boron is another one. Boron actually works with vitamin D. Both of them, vitamin D and boron, independently increase testosterone, but when they're uh, consumed together, well, not not you know together in the same second, but together in general in the same day or in your protocol, that helps to increase testosterone. So having low uh, 25D levels definitely will impact testosterone. This is a great question. With this genetics context is anemia still a copper deficiency or do you think it depends on genetics so that's a really good question and honestly one that i don't have a complete answer to yet um what i can say is it's definitely worth putting your information into self to code and seeing what comes up for anemia like i have my anemia report pulled up here And it looks at 500,000 genetic variants for anemia. And it says that I'm less likely to have it. And on this website and others, it said that I'm prone to having hereditary hemochromatosis. So that basically makes me more prone to iron overload. But then there's some other things to consider. Like on self to code there's sleep movement and it says that i'm likely to move more during sleep and apparently scientists call these movements periodic limb movements and it says these movements involve simple repetitive tightening or flexing of muscles mostly in the lower legs they usually don't disturb the mover of sleep but when they do they can make a person sleepy during the day So I'll circle back to this question of anemia being copper deficiency. But I've been using an aura ring again for the last couple of years pretty consistently. And what I've always noticed is that every single night, I haven't had a night where this doesn't show up. It says restlessness. Watch. So restlessness meaning that I was moving quite a bit. And even though I've been supplementing a lot of copper the last couple of years, eating a lot of liver, doing all of the things that are supposed to regulate my iron recycling system, taking retinol as cod liver oil and butter and eggs and milk and all that stuff. And it never stopped. And then see, so here on self decode, it says diet uh, factors that, you know, can improve uh, sleep movements. And it says, a lack of iron in the diet may make sleep movements worse. So that is completely contradictory to what I have been studying for the last two years. And I'm open to it. And it's important to note that oysters and beef liver actually contain a significant amount of iron. They do have copper in them as well, but they also have a significant amount of iron. I believe spirulina, the algae, also has a good amount of iron in it as well. And it also contains copper. So I'm still of the belief that it's not necessary to supplement actual iron. I'm very open to being wrong about that. But from what I understand, it's not necessary to take an iron extract. You can just take spirulina or beef liver or oysters and get a good amount of iron that way if you truly believe that you're deficient or you know anemic and not having a copper deficiency someone asks where to begin i feel like i don't understand all the lingo so going back and listening to my podcast is really useful a lot of the older ones are only going to be on youtube so if you search Mitolife Radio on YouTube, they should come up. And just listen to the ones that 
interest to you. The titles look good and read the description and see if it's something that you think would benefit you to learn. But also know that I am evolving at a very fast rate and have been for the last couple of years. And so I may not agree with what I said a year ago. And I think that's completely fine. I think people could still benefit from that information. Someone asked, what would you do for pigmentation spots on the face and hands? I would look at vitamin E if there are age spots. Uh, vitamin E can actually fade those over time. And if it's severe, then you could take vitamin E with every meal. If it's mild, I would say just once a day, take your vitamin E and see if that helps. Uh, why do you recommend the cigar? I enjoy it, but it's also a anti-parasitic. It has benefits to the brain at preventing Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And it's a really powerful anti-parasitic. I really feel like it's a blood cleaner with the nicotine content. Who makes that grounding sheet you recommend? Can't remember the brand. Mitolife, my company. We sell grounding sheets and they're really powerful, especially for dogs and cats. If you have an indoor pet, I think it's animal cruelty to not let them ground. And so I, I hope that People with indoor cats especially keep grounding sheets around for the pet to connect to because it would really reduce vet costs and improve their quality of life and lifespan. Why do I keep getting cavities even with a healthy diet and how to keep from getting them? I think it comes back to fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. So a lot of people focus on just magnesium and K2 and minerals because there's about 12 minerals that have to do with skeletal health and the bones and the teeth are essentially bones. But I think it comes back to fat soluble vitamins, the A, D, E, and K. And vitamin D especially is really important for preventing cavities because it's having to do with the absorption of calcium and the regulation of calcium and working with parathyroid hormone and that whole process. Look up dental health and vitamin D and you'll find tons of studies on it. So if you keep getting cavities or if you have poor dental health, I would definitely get your 25 OHD tested and see if you're low and if you're low, that's probably why you're getting cavities or a major contributing factor. Do you think vitamin K should be avoided if you have a genetic clotting disorder and not on blood thinners? My initial thoughts are no, just take a lower dose and don't megadose it. But I would definitely talk with someone that's more well-versed in genetics and figure that one out. But I think it's an essential vitamin and you shouldn't avoid it just because of that. Safe cookware. I use Extrema and Oziri exclusively. I had a short experiment, very short, with cast iron. And it was fun. I got passionate about it. I read a bunch of articles and watched a lot of YouTube videos and learned about seasoning and deep seasoning in the oven and I just still couldn't get it to work. And so I went back to Oziri, which is so nice for cooking eggs. I would say as long as you don't use metal on it, like a metal spatula, use a rubber or wooden, you're good. I think that's the big mistake that people make with this nonstick cookware and they freak out about leaching of whatever. If you're not scratching it with a metal spatula or metal utensils, I think it's going to last for a very long time and I think it's completely safe and I think Oziri is one of the best. And they actually have a great milk frother too. I just upgraded to about a month ago and I've been loving the Oziri milk frother. A best way to calm my nervous system. What I've been really enjoying is walking twice a day 
And if you work from home, it's really easy to be sedentary and you don't even realize it before, you know, it's dark and you haven't moved barely at all the whole day, except for just walking around the house, which doesn't really count. And so my friend John that I had on the show really inspired me to get into daily walking. And I'm in the perfect spot for it. I mean, the backwoods are right outside my door. And so I could walk right through the forest, beautiful environment, clean air, just have to watch out that I don't get eaten. But that's done a lot for my nervous system and really improves digestion. Even if you're not experiencing diarrhea or constipation, just improves digestion in general to walk just 10 minutes. And that does a lot for the nervous system. So I would experiment with that after breakfast and lunch, at least just go for a short walk and see if you start to feel better doing that for a few weeks. I know I have, the effect has been cumulative for me. Getting a ton of questions about supplement protocol for kids and what supplements to give kids slash children. It's always the same. They need fat soluble vitamins. They need water soluble vitamins like C and B vitamins. They need all the same stuff that we need. And so just the context, you know, if your child goes to the YMCA, I don't know if those are still around, but if they go in chlorinated pools often, then you have to be more on top of giving them ascorbic acid, in my opinion, because that helps neutralize the chlorine. So learning the context, you know, if they're getting loaded up on vegetable oils and polyunsaturated fats at school, then you probably want to make sure that their vitamin E intake is good. So just looking at their exposures and adjusting accordingly is really good. But I am working on a MitoLife Kids line because people really want that. And so I plan to make supplements that are easier to take uh, for children because a lot of children don't like capsules. And that is definitely in the works. High dose proteolytic enzymes, yay or nay to blood thinning. I don't think it's necessary in general to high dose proteolytic enzymes. Like my product dissolve it all is so strong that I've had really wild testimonials from people just taking one capsule a day. That makes it a really affordable supplement. I generally take three a day. Sometimes if I'm feeling like it, I take six, but I think it's more about the consistency than anything. And it's a great complement to, let's say, ozone therapy. I've gotten a lot of people into uh, the Crucial 4 ozone machine, and the rectal insufflation on that is so powerful. And that goes so well with the Dissolve It All product from MitoLife. It's just a perfect combination. What is your number one health tip for women? Well, based upon a lot of the women that I've interviewed here on the podcast, It seems like the majority have taken birth control, which increases estrogen and leads to polycystic ovarian syndrome and all sorts of mood and energy problems. So I would say vitamin E and systemic enzymes are very useful for any woman that's ever taken birth control because both of those will really help to undo the damage potentially and counter the estrogen with the vitamin E. I've just heard so many testimonials from women recovering from birth control, having huge success with those two in combination. Someone says itchy scalp, been taking magnesium and vitamin K and E still itchy. I would look at Retinol, that's a lot of the time the missing piece with a lot of different issues. So I would try Rosita cod liver oil and see if that helps. What's the best supplement I can take to improve my circulation? To me, that'd be systemic enzymes. So the natokinase and serapeptase. Uh, I sell one called Dissolve It All under my company MitoLife. 
uh, the fibrin, the fibrosis, really impedes circulation. So to break that up and dissolve it, so to speak, uh, does in increase uh, circulation. This is a really good one. Do you see the CLF protocol morphing into a based on your genetics approach? I'll definitely be adding more nuance and context. And this whole vitamin D thing with calcification is really interesting because there's definitely more to the story than just vitamin D causes calcification. It's a little more complex than that. So I love the constant refinement of the CLF protocol, like the importance of retinol to protect against lipid peroxidation to me is huge. And retinol to protect from lipofuscin is a really big deal. So having these epiphanies really helps me to refine the protocol. And I think that'll be a never ending thing. If you were to ever supplement with potassium, which form would you choose? So I've tried a few different ones, bicarbonate, chloride, citrate. I think all three of those are worth trying. They're pretty affordable. I've honestly felt the best from potassium citrate, but you really have to experiment with all the different forms and find one that you feel best on. What's your number one piece of health-related advice? It would be to not get stuck in any one paradigm forever. Whether that's beliefs about certain supplements being good and others being bad, or protocols being the best, or diets being the best, really being open to changing and adapting if something's not working for you. So it's almost 10 o'clock here. I'll do more of these Q&As because there are quite a few questions that I didn't have time for. But check out the Mighty Life Academy because I go live the last day of every month, usually for two to three hours, answering unlimited questions on there. And that's a place where you could ask me anything and learn about the newest things that I'm experimenting with and the new books that I'm reading and supplements that I'm trying. And that's a really fun thing for me to do is to have that community there with the Academy. And if you want to support this show, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have all of my recommended products up there. Um, I want to highlight No Choice. He makes a grounded EMF blocking clothing. And I think it's the best. I think it looks the coolest. And he just released a couple new products, uh, one called Incognito that almost looks like a mosquito net hat, but that's full coverage for your head. That would be awesome for like flying on a plane. Uh, he recently re released uh, women's shorts. That was in high demand because for a while there was only men's EMF blocking underwear. And I think it's really awesome that he has a baby blanket. A lot of people push their baby around in a stroller and they're just getting exposed to all sorts of fields, especially if you're in a public area. So I think it's really smart to wrap them up in that silver embedded uh, baby blanket. And it essentially works as a floating ground. So instead of the EMFs going through the baby, it goes around the baby through the blanket. And Mitolife is my brand. You can find that at mitolife.co. As I mentioned before, the brand is getting an upgrade. So I'm working hard on that and working hard to get a few new products out to you guys that I'm really excited about. And I am working on making the vitamin E capsules smaller. So once this batch sells out, at one point, I might do a little closeout sale uh, when the next ones release. But if you don't like the horse pills, the huge <laughs> capsules of PUFA Protect, know that smaller capsules are coming soon. And check out the beef liver. It's 100% New Zealand sourced, non-defatted, freeze-dried beef liver. 
And as I mentioned earlier in the show, it spiked with copper in the form of copper bisglycinate. And I've been taking that separate with liver for months. And I really like that form of copper, the copper bisglycinate. I feel really good on it. Even just taking a couple milligrams a day, I've tried all sorts of different doses. And even just a little microdose of copper, I definitely feel a mental boost from that. As I mentioned earlier on YouTube, you can check out the Mitolife Academy. You get two videos a month, two private videos, and then one live Q&A. And that's a wrap. I'll, I plan on doing more of these Q&As because people ask me so many questions and I just can't answer them all. So I'll do more shows like this in the near future. But if you want to really delve in and learn my thought process behind things, then I think the Mito Life Academy is a really great place to go. And it's only $15 a month. So I will see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged. Mm-hmm.